Good evening. My name is Corey Ackerman, and I am the Director of Research for the National Medal of Honor Museum. Joining me tonight is author Solace Wales, who wrote Braided in Fire, Black GIs and Tuscan Villagers on the Gothic Line, which is a fascinating story of Black soldiers who, repel, who fought against a German offensive towards the, towards the end of World War II, I'd say. But we're starting to get there, right, Solace? <laughs> yes. Anyway, all yours, take it away when you, when you feel. All right, I, I think uh, I need to explain that for many years, I was a children's art educator. Uh, I was originally director of something called the uh, International Child Art Center in San Francisco. Then when we moved to Marin, um, I opened a little school uh, called the Marin uh, Child Art Studio. And I also occasionally taught uh, college level art education classes. But at the same time um, that I worked with children, I did a little art myself and I also uh, did some writing, some of which turned into articles, but mostly it was journal writing. And then in 1975, my artist husband and I started living part-time, uh, about a third of a year actually, in a tiny uh, village in the foothills of uh, Tuscan Apennines in, in Italy. We had bought a ruin of a house and we're fixing it up and we had a toddler uh, daughter. And uh, so, uh, and, but I continued while we were there writing these sort of reflective uh, kinds of journal entries, okay? While right under my feet was this absolutely explosive story, you know, and uh, the, the villagers, even the very first, when we first started living in this house, told us a couple of stories about their experiences during the war and I was fascinated but as soon as they stopped talking about it I would completely forget about this because uh, I couldn't envision modern day soldiers in this bucolic uh, contadino peasant village with its you know beautiful vegetable gardens and prized geraniums and, and life was so uh, bucolic and, and uh, pleasant it just didn't compute really, you know, so I didn't, <laughs> I, I, I didn't, uh, I couldn't really envision this at all. Uh, so in any case, uh, it took 12 years really uh, before I seen some of the older villagers die and realizing that their experiences of the war um, wouldn't be captured, that somebody had to capture this story. So I began um, interviewing and I started with my next door neighbor who was uh, 90 years old bedridden, very sharp though. And, uh, and she and her 65 year old daughter were very, very um, articulate and, and uh, you know, and then other people joined. And then I realized this is a bigger story than I even knew. And I had yet to learn anything much about uh, the black GIs who were present. Um, so, uh, in any case, it became a passion to find out what actually happened in this village that had become my adopted village. Okay, so it, it, and it's a history, a World War II history that is little known, but it, it is truly remarkable. Anyway, I have some uh, photographs that I'd like to share. So we'll see if I can manage to figure to do that. Let's see here. Um, Hang on. Okay. Uh, Corey, I see you and me. Are they going to remain there? Are we going to remain in the picture like this? I suppose. Oh no, your 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 um, presentation is live now, Solace. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Well, this, as you can see, is the cover of the book, and it shows Soma Colonia, the little village with smoke coming up. Um, from the, the, what happened during the war, from the bombardments. And then three of the book's main can, uh, protagonists. Now I call them protagonists, but they're real people, that uh, most of whom I uh, interviewed, except for John Fox, who's at the uh, prominent in the story and at the top. Um, you'll hear more about him for, uh, shortly. And in the middle is Anna Moscardini, um, a, a wonderful villager who was a fun loving and, and a very generous, though from one of the poorest families in this village, which at the time of the Second World War was a poor Contadina village. Now the word 
contadino it should be explained a little bit it translates as peasant but it has a, a deeper connotation in italian because they though they had a hard life of, of agriculture in uh, this rocky soil that wasn't uh, too easy um they they had wonderful these strong traditions and a, a very strong society so that it was there was a, a real beauty in so i'm trying to say in their their way of life and with, that's one of the things that attracted my husband and, and me to this uh so anyway here's selma colonia um we have pre-war uh picture and you can see this structure at the very top this very prominent large structure and that is the La Roca Tower, which was a 10th century fortress at the very top of the, of the village. And um, it, it looks like from this photograph that, that Soma Colonia is on the flat, but in fact, it's on its own little mountaintop. It, actually, it's not so little, it's about 2,300 feet altitude. Um, but the reason it looks flat is that this photograph was taken from a neighboring village, which is also on its own mountaintop. So it's, this is a very mountainous region. So it, 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 um, it looks, um, it's down below you see these fields. Now, I don't think, the, I think those are the fields of the, where the, uh, the village the, uh, was, the photograph was taken from. But Selma Colonia also has similar fields down below it where you know the villagers grew uh, wheat for bread making bread and of course vegetables and hay for the animals and so on it was a, a very nearly self-sufficient contadino community and one might wonder how this little village in, on the way to nowhere and in the middle of isolated like this how in the world this could play a, a, a part um, in the 20th century warfare in, in world war ii um, the, but it's important to understand about that it was right on the Gothic line. Now, what was the Gothic line? It's the defensive position that Germans established that uh, ran all the way across the Italian peninsula from Massa on the Turanian coast to, to over the, to the Adriatic um, uh, and, uh, to the east. And uh, on, it was called Gothic because it was the same line of defense that the Goths used in the sixth century against the Byzantines that the Germans called named it. It was a very natural place to establish such a line because the mountains in that position are formidable and form a natural barricade. And then the Axis forces added thousands of concrete reinforced gun pits, thousands, I mean, I'm literally like 17,000 uh, machine gun nests, and, and even a few cannon stations where they it put cannons in, managed to get cannons up to caves in the mountains and then they could roll them out when appropriate. Uh, so it, 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 this was a, a formidable barrier, this Gothic line. Um, and how did they accomplish all this work to, in the fortifying this line? They took civilian Italians as slave labor and forced them at gunpoint to do it. And that Hitler was so determined to hold the Gothic line that he proclaimed that any of his generals who uh, ordered a retreat from the line would be executed. <coughs> now, Soma Colonia was one of the dots just on the Allied side of the Gothic line, while Lama, a little hamlet of about eight huts, which actually belonged to Soma Colonia, uh, it, it was only a mile and a half uphill, was on the Axis side. Lama was occupied, oh, oh, wait a minute, I switched the, hang on. Uh, Lama was occupied uh, by, eventually by the Germans who, they, who established an encampment of troops there. So, you know, it's very understand, easy to understand how precarious Soma Colonia's position was. Um, okay, wait a minute. Then uh, here's a photograph that you could see that, uh, Soma Colonia is on its own little promontory. Um, that's the main reason I included that one. And here's a photograph taken of Soma Colonia in the early 1980s from a helicopter. So you can get a picture of the, of the um, buildings. Now, the La Roca Tower that we saw in that first photograph uh, is just to the uh, right of the German, of the um, church tower. 
and it, it just looks like a, a kind of enormous tree or something, just a bunch of greenery up there. Okay, when uh, when I first came to the village, people talked about this tower ruin, and I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. All I saw was a bunch of rubble and then some ivy and a whole lot of greenery, and I, you know, I had no notion of what this tower ruin was, but I'll show you a picture a little bit later. All right. Oh, I meant to say, go back here, that um, as you can imagine, Soma Colonia is the backdrop to this story. And it's the home, of course, of the villagers that we explore. Um, and it's where the, 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 the um, soldiers, sorry, I'm skipping ahead, where the soldiers that we are gonna um, get to know, um, were garrisoned, okay. Um, but so that's a, an important backdrop, but there's a, another one, which is the 366th Infantry Regiment. Now this photograph is pretty remarkable. It was taken in 1942 and it shows the entire regiment of, I think it was 3,250 men, all black. This, this was a very unusual, um, uh, regiment for uh, for that time. Um, and uh, it was, they were at Fort Devens where they trained and uh, it, uh, it, it's in the snow. I just think it's kind of amazing that they were able to take this photograph. But the, the Soma Colonians were very, I mean, the, the Soldiers were very proud of this regiment, which had as its commander a black man. And um, uh, so in a way, this was home to many of, of the soldiers. Now, wait a minute, I wanted to, to, to say something further about this. Um, while all the black soldiers serving in the US military at the time suffered from prejudice, this, this 366 regiment suffered particularly severely. Um, when this regiment arrived in Italy, for months they were shuffled into service positions instead of being sent to the front as combat soldiers for which they had been well trained. When finally in late November, 1944, they were sent to the front, uh, they were attached to the 92nd Buffalo Division. Um, the 92nd Division's general General Amon outranked the 366 commanding colonel who became quite intentionally from Amon's point of view, uh, superfluous. So General Amon from Virginia was notoriously prejudiced and he was not pleased with the high ranking officers in, this, in the unit placed under his command. So his welcome speech upon the regiment's arrival in the Sergio Valley was the following. I did not send for you. Your Negro newspapers, Negro politicians, and white friends have insisted on your seeing combat, and I shall see that you get combat and your share of the casualties. Well, he certainly kept his word. Um, anyway, wait a minute. So this right. just a quick question about that speech. Was that speech recorded in any way, or was that reconstructed from recollections of people who heard it? Uh, no, I don't think it was recorded, but it was so many people re remembered it. This was unforgettable that I think it's pretty accurate. I mean, the wording may be slightly off, but, but the, it came from many sources. And the only question was where exactly he gave the speech. And I have established that I, I believe it's correct that he gave it in Barga, um, which is just the big the city below. Um, well, it's not, a, it's a very small city below um, Soma Colonia. Um, because the, the rock, the medic said he listened to it on the day of his father's birthday and then, and then was sent up that night to Soma Colonia. And he's, his memory was so good on everything else that I imagine that's true. But so, some people put it in Viarejo, you know, they place it in different places. But um, in, in any case, I think, I think it occurred in, in Barga. Um, okay. Um, now, we, obviously, these these are uh, these are Soma colonians. This, now, the, the the book is told intimately through the lives of uh, eight uh, characters, and, and there are four 
uh, African American soldiers and for uh, villagers. The African American soldiers are all from the 366th Regiment. The villagers are all connected to the Biondi family. Now, this is uh, on the right is Adelmo Biondi, who is the elder brother, though shorter than um, Berto, who's next to him. They, the photo was, that they took this photograph because they were in the Luca train station and um, uh, Adelmo was just about to go off to um, uh, his military training. Uh, Adelmo, the one on the right, um, was a very reluctant uh, soldier. He, he wanted nothing to do with firearms or uh, uh, anything to do with being a soldier. But, you know, in fascist Italy, uh, there was no little box that a conscientious objector to check. I mean, he had no choice. He was drafted, period. And he wanted, he, what he wanted to do was stay home and, and be a tailor, which he had trained for. And he, uh, he wanted to remain with his beloved fiance, Anna, whose picture you saw earlier. But um, now Berto on the left had a different kind of conviction. Uh, he, he became uh, a partisan fighter eventually. Uh, in this picture, you know, the Adelmo's only about 18 and, and Berto's 16 or 17. So uh, there was just a year and a half between them. Um, Berto, um, here's another picture of him. You can see he was very handsome. He, um, uh, this photograph was taken immediately after the war when he became a policeman. I mean, you know, there aren't too many pictures that occur that we have during the war. Anyway, um, uh, Berto uh, had extraordinary adventures as a, a partisan fighter. Now, I, I should probably say that because not everybody knows that the partisans were guerrilla fighters who assisted the allies in pushing the Germans northward uh, and out of Italy was the idea. Um, and, so I, he, his, but Berto's adventures, I can tell you his first one because it, it's sort of simple, but uh, he, he was asked to carry a message from Barga, the, the town below, up to Selma Colonia. There, in those days, there, there was no car, uh, road for cars. Oops, sorry. Um, um, so he walked up to the village to give the, to deliver this message to the uh, partisan leader garrison in Selma Colonia. Um, and, but upon arriving home in his home village in the little piazza, he discovered two Germans. So he chased them around the edge of the La Roca wall and they headed down the ravine northward towards Lama where their, their encampment was. And Berta started shooting at them. He didn't hit them, but a couple of German sentries uh, on the other side of the ravine started shooting at Berto. And then the allies it, that were currently in uh, Selma Colonia were up in the La, La Roca field above him, began shooting at him too. Now at the time, the allies were uh, in, the, in, in the village were Brazilian and they didn't recognize Berto because the partisans didn't have any uniforms at that time. And so Berto was dancing about being in his, in his home town, being shot at by, by both friend and foe. It, it's truly miraculous he survived. I, I won't explain how, but, uh, he went on to have numerous extraordinary adventures. Okay, now here's a picture of Anna again. Um, the name should be Mos Anna Moscardini, not Anna Moscardi, but anyway. Um, she is not a Biondi, but she was engaged to Adelmo, the, the pacifist, and thus is to become a member of the Biondi family. The touching thing about this picture is that Anna is wearing a coat made in 1945 by Adelmo. At that juncture of the war, supplies of any kind were very scarce. And uh, so they, you know, fabrics simply weren't available along with most everything else. Adelmo made the coat out of an American army blanket, the one fabric that, that one could find in abundance, okay? Um, now here is Anna at an older age. I took this photograph of her and I think it was probably the late 90s. And you can see that her straightforward nature is uh, direct. Um, and, and picture behind here, behind her, well, she's with her, 
where she had a small vegetable garden just below the uh, Somaphonia. And you can see the larger town of Barga down below in the valley below. And then uh, beyond that, the Apawane coastal mountains in the background. Okay, now here we are back with Lieutenant John Fox. It is, uh, oops, uh oh. Uh, it's not a spoiler to explain that he sacrificed himself in an act of extreme heroism uh, in the Soma Colonia uh, battle of December 26, 1944. Everyone reading Braden Fire will know that ahead of time. Um, and also that he posthumously received the Medal of Honor for his action uh, in 1997. All right, he was forward observer in the village, which meant that he directed artillery fire. And in order to do this, he needed good visibility. So he chose the third floor, at the top floor of the La Roca Tower as his OP, his outpost. When towards the end of the Somaclonia battle, which lasted more than four hours, he saw that his tower was surrounded by swarms of German soldiers. He called his artillery unit down below in the valley below and asked for cannon fire onto his own location. His best friend, Otis Zachary, answered the phone at the battery. And when he heard Fox's request, he said, no, I can't do that, man. When, when Fox insisted that he must, and he must do it soon, he said, I'd better put the colonel on. Uh, the colonel, his superior officer, the colonel questioned Fox thoroughly, making sure he knew what, what he was doing. Finally, Fox, losing patience, it yelled, fire it, give him hell. The, the colonel ordered Zachary then to fire the cannons. The anguish at having to carry out this order affected Zachary's performance for the rest of the war, and it disturbed him the rest of his life. Actually, when I first uh, spoke with Zachary over the phone, he said, you know, 50 years might seem like a lot to you, but it doesn't to me. I, I lie awake at night sometimes, just hating this moment. So anyway, wait a minute. Here is what, at the end of, right at, after the war, after he'd been hit by cannon fire and bombing, um, is what the La Roca Tower looked like. You kind of see the scale a little bit with that figure down at the bottom. Um, it didn't remain in this condition for long because it was deemed too precarious. It could fall on the neighboring house. And the, so the top of it was taken down and the stones got used in, in repairing village houses. Okay. Um, now we're skipping way ahead here. Um, here is uh, the, the, wait a minute, I'm looking at my notes. Um, oh, right here it is, wait a minute. It took a few minutes for John Fox to be honored, to, to have his request in Silva Colonia honored, but because of the color of his skin, it took 92 years, I mean, 52 years for his country to honor him with the Medal of Honor. It was January 13th, 1997, when President Clinton presented Fox and six other African Americans for World War II action. Uh, this is Fox's widow, Arlene Fox, with President Clinton. A remarkable person, Arlene figures in the story too. Okay, this is a photo I took at the ceremony. Just after I introduced Otis Zachary, the one who had to fire the cannons, who was on the left, to Rothaker Smith, who was nicknamed Rock, known as Rock in the story. The White House band is playing in the background. They were both with the 366, but had not known one another. All I had to do was say that Zachary fired the cannons at Soma Colonia while Rock was in the village. And Rock said to him, you were trying to kill me. Oh no, Zachary counted. I was a really good artilleryman. If I was trying to kill you, you'd be dead. <laughs> Zachary was ever the jokester with a quick comeback, but you can see that in reality, uh, maybe that didn't amuse Rock so much. This was a very serious encounter. Um, 
Okay, here is um, Rock as, as a 19 year old uh, private. Now he was a conscientious objector medic stationed in Selma Colonia with a machine gun outfit. He was Seventh Day Adventist and very serious about his pacifist stance in accord with his religion. Once one of the machine gunners handed him a gun and said, hey man, up here you're nude without a gun. And Rock thought to himself that God would take care of him better without a gun. But he was too embarrassed to say that to his machine gunner buddy. He, he carried the gun around for three days and then he gave it back saying that it was too heavy to carry with his medical equipment. Now, what happened to Rock is, uh, is just an unbelievable uh, story, mind boggling, but you, you have to find out about that in the book. Um, but there is a kind of funny, uh, kind of amazing symmetry in that among the four African-Americans is a, a, a gussy soldier and a pacifist, just as there are among the four villagers. Both, both pacifists behave courageously also as did women villagers, by the way, who hid wounded black soldiers at the risk of their own lives. Okay, now let's see. Here we are back at the Medal of Honor um, uh, event um, ceremony. And my excuse, for, uh, this is me um, considerably younger. It was almost 25 years ago. And it, but in this picture, it, it, Zachary is at the far left and he's the next one to, hit, to shake and President Clinton's hand. Um, I was invited to the ceremony by Arlene, whom I had interviewed before John Fox had become known or famous. We became friends over the phone. And so, and, and as, as, as I said, she figures in the story as well. Um, all right, here is the tower ruin as it looks today, or as it looked when I last saw it. I have to correct this because today there is construction around it. The, the village of Soma Colonia, in conjunction with the Comune de Barga, the larger town, which is the governmental seat, uh, they're making a small museum out of the tower ruin by enclosing the space with uh, glass and some wood. And the new, new museum will include battle reports and military history, memorabilia found in the vicinity, a GI's jacket, cartridges of all calibers, military mess kits, you know, German grenade, uh, uh, a BC 311 military radio, and there'll be fabulous pictures of, of the participants of, and um, of the related ceremonies. And, and, and importantly, a list of all of those who died. And th this was, uh, originally I had the names of four black Americans who died in this horrific battle. And now there are 42 names. Um, if we talk about research, I might explain how that happened. Um, so the, um, this nearly completed, this is nearly completed this new museum and was supposed to open this um, uh, <clears throat> summer, but I don't know with COVID, I, it's, I think it's uncertain that they're gonna have the ceremony opening it this summer. Okay, I just threw this photograph in to give you an idea where well, the last one was all stone, but this is in a very beautiful kind of uh, spot with nature. To the far left is the back, is the wall of the back side of the tower ruin, but you can see this again looks out over the Serkio Valley and onto the coastal mountains. <coughs> Now here's the final photograph uh, that I'm going to show, but it's it's of um, the marker to John Fox that I first noticed in 1980 in in a Soma Colonia monument dedicated to the Martirio de la Resistenza, which is the martyrs of the resistance. Now these were partisans, seven partisans, who died in the Soma Colonia battle, and I, I realized then how extraordinary it was that an American was honored in an Italian monument. But no one in the village could tell me who he was or what he did. John Fox, I, I, I had no idea. And, but, but it did uh, prompt me um, and set me off on my journey of discovery to a certain extent, uh, wondering about this, what, who was this and what did happen in Soma Colonia. So uh, it, 
got me wondering about my the, the, the his, this history. Now we can turn this off. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, now I, I, I've talked a lot about um, the Somophonia battle, but I think it's important to say that the book is actually uh, not uh, not just about the battle. It's about the entire war period. And so that you follow um, the villagers during the wartime fascist period when ultimately they experienced uh, hunger and, and um, horrific fear of bombardment and then, then the terror about the political um, realities, which were pretty heavy. You know, the, the young men had to hide often in the woods because if they were found by German patrols or fascist patrols, they could be taken for slave labor or just sent to a concentration camp. So that, that there was real worry. And then it, it also follows um, uh, what happened to the black soldiers, their backgrounds and uh, the training they had and the feeling they had about their extraordinary regiment. Um, and then, then it also covers the, the aftermath in which the villagers were rebuilding their, their, their village and there was all this war debris left behind, mines and so on, which caused problems and tragedy. Um, and then the reader follows the 366 soldiers who, uh, in the aftermath too, who eventually arrive home with no victory parades and with no change in the Jim Crow uh, situation. In fact, the, the, the John Fox's very comrades were ordered when they got to uh, uh, Virginia Beach, they were ordered uh, to get in the bus and go to the back of the bus. And uh, Robert Brown, one of the soldiers said, hey, listen, we've been on the front. We've been waiting to, and the, to the back of the bus, they were told, because the front of the bus was reserved for white German POWs, okay? And so that was their greeting home. Um, so anyway, um, well, I think that's enough. What do you have any questions, Corey? About yeah, I'm going to take my prerogative and ask you some questions. Well, you know, here at the Medal of Honor Museum, we're much more a biography museum. So I'm really interested in your impressions of John Fox's early life, like beyond his Medal of Honor action. Like, mm -hmm. what was he like as a young man? Well, everybody, I would ask all the soldiers who knew him um, about that. And they, many of them said, well, he was sort of a life of the party kind of guy. And he was, he was, daring and very adventurous, adventurous, but he loved a good time. But talking to Arlene and some of the others who, who knew him, uh, especially Arlene, he had a very serious side and she saw, he, he was a, 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 a true soldier. He wanted to make uh, the military his life and he was uh, very serious about it. So it, 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 even though he had this fun loving side and he drove very fast too, <laughs> he, he uh, scared to death one of his friends, you know. Uh, it, um, uh, Robert Brown had, was going with him uh, to, to get some, to pick up sticks of dynamite, I guess. And uh, they, they were, it, Fox was driving and it was a very, the, the road was full of husks of, uh, uh, and, and it was very slippery. And this guy was hanging on to these dynamite sticks. Definitely something you want to speed with. Dynamite is absolutely <laughs> something you want to speed with on a <laughs> on a small mountain road. So anyway, he 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 liked to drive fast. But um he you know he was quite an amazing uh, uh, person. I mean Arlene told the the birth of their child he she went into labor in and and it was they were in Ayers, Massachusetts, which is sort of the bedroom little community for this uh, Fort Devons, which is where uh, John Fox was stationed. And uh, um, what to do, you know, because she went into labor and the snow was way up to the, you know, I don't know how many feet, four feet, and how could they get to the hospital? And so what he did was went out and, and found with extraordinary difficulty, I would imagine, uh, of, of someone who, of, who had a tractor that could pull a plow <laughs> and, and they drove behind that to the hospital and they got to the hospital and Arlene said, well, it's, it's a beautiful morning. Why don't we drive around for a minute? <laughs> and so 
John said, oh, sure, you know, anyway, to the horror of the, uh, the hospital's nurses who had been waiting for. Her. Anyway, that's, he just seemed to like, see what was needed at that, at the moment, you know. He also sounds really resourceful. And yes, and, and to do what was required, which of course in Selma Colonia was mind boggling. But anyway, he, he did, you know, what the situation yeah. seemed to require. Right, I, I can't imagine the mindset of someone who would call an artillery strike down on himself in well, order exactly. to save I mean, lives, it, right? Yeah. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the battle, it was a German offensive operation winter getting, I'm sorry, my German is not very good. Um, winter better. Yeah. Yeah. Winter getter. And during winter, the battle, winter, I guess it's winter, I think it is, but anyway, yeah. winter, winter, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce it either. The town was overrun completely by German soldiers all over the streets. When Fox calls in the artillery strike on his own position in order to delay the Germans, and it buys crucial time. I mean, as I recall, these were mountain troops who were assaulting the town. They would have quickly moved through it and uh, onto other vital objectives had they not been slowed down, um, which is a crucial well, part of his happened. action. It actually took them, um, it's not a sh long distance, it's only three miles to Barga, um, uh, and they would have covered that in less than an hour normally, but they didn't get to Barga until for 24 hours, and that did allow the troops there to to retreat and organize and so on, that and, and civilians as well. So that was a something that happened as a result of what his action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Fox also gives us an interesting peek behind the curtain in terms of the way. For people who don't know, Medal of Honor awards have multiple levels of approval that they have to go through, um, especially in the modern award once you get past 1917. So in Fox's case, as I recall, his he had a recommendation that was written and it just didn't go anywhere, correct? Two, two recommendations. And well, recommendations. It, it, it didn't go up the line of chimp. One assumes that it stopped with General Almond, who didn't send it on up the line, the, the chain of you know, command to, to, to be acted on. Did you ever, in, your, in the course of your research, did you ever find those original recommendations? Oh, yes, I did, actually. Um, uh, uh, one was uh, a fellow who was right there on the scene with, you know, uh, but the other was uh, someone who lived in Ohio. I've, I've forgotten his name, but he just caught it in the newspaper and he said, well, I did recommended him. And he, he wrote, it, it's quite touching actually what he wrote, you know, he said, 52 years. I mean, what difference does the color of skin make? You know? <laughs> so any, anyway, uh, yes, there were two but neither one made it up. And, and originally, I mean, there, there have to, according to the protocol, there has to be uh, a recognition within two years of, of the action has to be put forth. And of course it was way past time. And so Congress had to actually vote to extend the time because no Medal of Honor was given to a black uh, serviceman uh, after the war. And whereas uh, there were these deserving people, of course. Yeah, although Fox did receive that, the Distinguished Service Cross, I think it was in 1982, but that's okay. the, the basis of the upgrade for in, to his 97 Medal of Honor, right? It's just his, whole, his award path was really fascinating to me generally because he gets the Distinguished Service Cross in the 80s and then he gets upgraded again uh, after that congressionally mandated review. Um, but in the meantime, I've got some audience, audience questions. So I'll, I'll lobby some of those. I don't want to take up all of your time as much as I could. Um, so Mark asks, what did you discover about interactions between the native Italian residents and the U.S. troops in Soma Colonia or in the area generally? Well, there was a very uh, redeeming kind of relationship that happened um, with the, the, uh, vill the villagers. You know, Soma Colonians had never seen a black person before and very few of them had even been to the movies. But so when these, but when these guys arrived, you know, they were pretty desperate and they saw the, these black Americans as their liberators, which indeed they were. And so the villagers uh, went out of their way to help them get firewood and water and the women did the laundry, which they were well paid for, which of course was a great boon. And the, but the, the, and the soldiers who saw that these people were really very hungry 
And they really generously shared their rations um, with you know, the, the villagers. They would say, I fame mama, they called everybody mama, even Anna Moscardini, who was just this skinny little <laughs> teenager, um, you know, and the, of course, the, the villagers were really grateful for this uh, generosity. And the, but the, the soldiers had been told by their superiors not to share their rations, not to fraternize with the civilians, but in fact, the, they did. And it was a, a, a kind of a wonderful thing that they, many of them had ate together and they would, you know, they would, uh, the villagers would supply what they had, which of course was wine. That was a very welcome item. And um, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it's a sort of a sour wine up in Southern Polonia because it's a little too high to get the, the, the grapes to, to mature properly. But never mind that they had wine and they had chestnuts and things made with chestnuts. And, um, and, and they, after dinner, they would play checkers and, you know, um, it was a, a, a kind of wonderful little moment in time. And, and they became friends to the point where when the Biondi family was uh, living elsewhere uh, in another little tiny out of the way place, um, one, of the, one of the friends that they had befriended was a guy named Robbins. That's all they could remember, but they were, uh, Robbins searched them out, searched where they were. And he showed up one day with, uh, this is after the battle, with a mule loaded with flour and sugar and things that were, were of real use to the, uh, to the Biondis. And they had a, a wonderful celebration, you know, uh, when they, they were so happy to see him and that he was still alive. Uh, so there was that connection that was very touching and uh, kind of a moment in, 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 amidst all this horror. And of course, with the blacks, uh, you know, uh, many of them had never had good relations with white people before. So that was a kind of wonderful revelation. I mean, it sounds like they got on pretty well, which is good. Oh, the, the devotion of resources that the United States put into that area of World War II. Um, Anna asks, what was it like being at the White House, at a White House Medal of Honor ceremony? Well, it was extraordinary. It was, and it was, in this particular case, it was kind of reverential. I mean, it was a military occasion, of course, and all the, you know, the, um, Military brass was there, and Colin and Powell and every everyone, um, and the whole cabinet and so on. But uh, despite the, it was everybody in the audience. There was many blacks in the audience, would, uh, which was great. But and everyone present, I, we I just felt it knew that this occasion went beyond the the the, the military. It was a moment of. of recognition of the our country's failure you know a kind of admission uh, to respond appropriately to its uh, um, black population and so there was a there was a moment when it was just went quiet and i i, I just felt it was like a, a a little the whole audience was completely silent and it was like a a, a, a moment of prayer of, of recognition of what um what had happened, the remarkable thing that had happened. Interesting. Uh, as a follow-up to that, did, did President Clinton seem impressed by the ceremony and by the recipient? Well, at that point, there was only one, I believe there was only one recipient who was alive to collect his Medal of Honor, right? Yes, Ber Vernon Baker. Vernon Baker, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was just over from Selma Colonia, actually, with, for his, his action. He was an amazing person. Yes, Clinton seemed, actually, he was quite, quite taken with Arlene for good reason. I remember when he came out, I saw him walk all the way across the room to, to say something to her. And I didn't see her during the, during the, during the festivities because he was the, the Medal of Honor. Those who were receiving the, the Medal of Honor were in a special room with President Clinton. He was magnificent on this occasion. You know, he, it was really heartfelt, you know. And when he said, you know, um, history has been made whole today, it, it, it resounded. It was he. He was right there with it. It was. It was. He was great. All right. Let's take a step back. Back into the, um, like the battle itself. Someone asks, "Did the Americans break through as a result of the battle?" Can you talk about the strategic implications of what happened in and around Selma Colonia? 
did the Americans, what was the question? Did the uh, Americans break through as a result of the battle? Uh, no, quite the reverse. The Germans broke through. And it's, it's the only place on the Gothic line where the Axis forces broke through the line, okay? Um, and, uh, but the reason was, was that uh, these 366 guys were left uh, in the village in too few numbers. There were only, uh, there was, uh, you know, a whole battalion there, um, even the night of Christmas night. And this happened, the attack was, was the next morning. But the, the commander in charge, the lieutenant colonel in charge of that battalion withdrew because he found out that the Germans were attacking. And he just abandoned this, this, the 366 guys who um, um, were from this regiment that wasn't part of his usual men. In other words, it was the attached regiment of the 366. And so there were only 75 soldiers left to defend Soma Colonia along with 25 or so partisans. And uh, the, the Germans attacked in numbers three times that and not only, it, but, and they were from specially trained mountain battalion troops. So, you know, it was, uh, but, you know, initially, uh, the, well, it's complicated, but the white uh, soldiers uh, and, and officers would speak poorly of the Blacks performance, okay? To the point where even the Italians residents sort of believed that they were wonderful people but not particularly good soldiers. Well, however, uh, if you take into consideration that this battle uh, happened uh, at starting at, in, in full blast, starting at 7 a.m. in the morning, and it, and it wasn't until 11 that Fox called down for their artillery fire. In other words, there was, there was, uh, they really fought well, that's <laughs> what I'm trying to say. And, 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 and the, the battle went on for more than four hours. Uh, so um, you can't say they, and they were way outnumbered, you know. Uh, so in any case, then the Germans did take Soma Colonia and, but it was, they were delayed because of Fox's action, partly. Yeah, there's an interesting discrepancy there between his citation and your reconstruction of the battle in Braided and Fire, because in his citation, it says, as I recall, the, the, the Germans infiltrated the town, right? But in Braided and Fire, you, you say that the Italian partisans actually engage German forces in sort of a brief skirmish before they attack the town in force. I have that right? No, actually, that, that's not correct. Um, but it, it it does say in the citation that uh, that the that the village was infiltrated by enemy soldiers, but it, it was just a mistake because what happened was in the night new partisans came to the village. Well, they didn't have uniforms, and so somebody thought that these, in fact, were enemy soldiers that had just civilian clothes on, and that's what they reported. But that's not the case. What what, what is the case is that. There were, you know, the uh, there were new troops being sent up by the partisans to replace the guys that were stationed there um, during the night, during Christmas night. So that's the confusion on that one. No, it's interesting. It's interesting that that makes it into the citation, um, in terms of, and I think that you wrote in the book that it's because they don't that when the citation was being constructed, there wasn't much research on the ground in Soma Colonia, correct? Well, absolutely. There was nobody doing, doing research in Italy and asking, you know, the partisans what happened or the, you know, uh, so, so that it quite, it's quite natural they would make a mistake or, or the, whoever observed these fellows coming in in civilian clothes assumed that they were enemy, but, but they weren't, you know, so it's, and there were several things about that. In, in the book, I have a afterward that explains how my version differs from the, um, the version that, that is on the citation. Now, you know, you have to understand, I, I was a very unlikely candidate for sleuthing military facts from, <laughs> from 50 years and more, you know, but I became passionate about this, you know, getting things right and getting it really, yep. what really happened. And so, you know, it, it, I was passionate about the village. And then 
and the villagers, of course, is my adopted village, but I was also passionate about uh, telling the story of these black guys the way it really was, you know, um, uh, and showing that the, what they did, which was uh, to give their all despite the appalling treatment they'd received. Well, yeah, I mean, speaking of you living in, in the area, based on your living in the area, how do the residents feel about World War II? Is there, is there a commemorative sense of the era? Oh, absolutely. Every year on the, the uh, anniversary of the battle, there's a, a big mass and gathering. And, and uh, no, they're, they're, it's, uh, and now they're doing this museum. This is this all this time later. But, but you have to realize that Soma Colonia at the time of uh, World War II had about 300 inhabitants. And now if you talk about permanent inhabitants, because there are people like us who come and go, but then, you know, foreigners who found that the, the delight of the place, um, but permanent residents, they're probably about 30 now, you see. Really, that few. Yeah. And they're elderly. It's because, you know, people with young children want to be where the schools are and other children and so the young I always we always thought young people would come and, and, and fix up some of these wonderful old houses but uh, it's been foreigners who have done that actually so but new life will be injected into the village in a new way it won't be back and there's no more contadino lifestyle but but this museum will bring real interest and it will be very moving to visit I think and so, yeah, I look forward to being able to see it myself. I mean, it's yeah. definitely a fascinating artifact. I mean, that it was damaged. I mean, it looks like it hasn't been really repaired that much. That the it World War II, the damage from World War II still echoes into the present. Oh, absolutely. And the, the, you know, people are in the village or that are involved are very passionate about it. So, um, I, I I'm sorry I didn't have a picture of where it is right now. I haven't seen it myself. I keep trying to get it. But it will be shortly on my website, which is uh, braidedinfire.com. So it's easy to find. It isn't there currently, but there's a lot of other stuff there that's interesting. Um, this is a question for the audience. Did the black soldiers feel any sense of anger or hatred toward against the Germans? Now, is this for me? Yeah, from the audience for you. Oh, oh, well, certainly, um, you know, uh, they knew that uh, they were they were dealing with someone you know uh, troops they were dealing with a, a force that believed in white supremacy and you know the Aryan superiority and uh, they knew that if they'd been they believed if they were captured they would be shot off you know out of hand because uh, of the attitudes of the, the of the Germans that's what they believed and in some cases that happened there was no German policy that directed that. But it did happen on various occasions, but not all, it turns out. So anyway. All right. Um, well, another question for the audience for you, Salas. On American battlefields, there are numerous markers and monuments indicating military actions. Are there any physical reminders of World War II in the area we talked about this morning? I know we talked about the tower being destroyed. Are there any other kind of remnants like that? Well, you see empty fields where there were once houses. <laughs> You know, uh, I mean, that's a, it, it, but, but the casual visual uh, visitor doesn't notice that. It just looks like a nice little green area. Uh, and, and it took me years to, to figure it out. But, um, and there are a few houses where you see the old foundations in there amongst vegetables that people are currently using the land for. Um, but then in, in 2009, there was a ceremony uh, with uh, Joseph Harrison, uh, who was a Buffalo soldier with the 92nd Division, uh, to name the path, the mule path, that all the soldiers came up, including John Fox. Now, Fox came up in a, in a Jeep, but most of them didn't. They walked up. It, the American Jeep was the first uh, motorized vehicle in Soma Colonia, you mm -hmm. know, because it could make it up this mule fare, tra path. But they put up a plaque and uh, that said, that called the mule path um, via the 92nd division, um, the Buffalo division. And they didn't, they weren't excluding the 366 men. They just it, it assumed 
because in Italy, even those with the 366 were always called Buffalo soldiers because they just assumed any black American was a Buffalo soldier. Whereas in fact, the 366 guys did not wear the Buffalo emblem. Right, right. Yeah. And, and felt very attached to their own regiment. I think that uh, I'd like to close by talking once more about John a little bit. Is there a particular anecdote about him that you find that you just really catches your attention or your eye that you'd like to share with us? Well, you know, um, not so much um, other than what I've already explained uh, about uh, uh, Sandra Fox's birth and, and uh, his handling of that. Um, and, you know, he, well, I can tell one little story he, he, that Arlene told me. Um, when they were courting, he was going up to Maine. He, he was stationed partly part of the time in Maine as, as they were, were guarding um, bridges and things because they were afraid Germans might attack. Uh, the, uh, there was a German submarine seen off the coast of uh, the East Coast. So anyway, the, the, there were the 366 guys were, were guarding certain places that were crucial, critical in, in Maine. And John Fox befriended an old man who um, uh, took him out fishing and he got very involved with, the, with this fishing and he loved this old guy. And, you know, he was a New Englander, this fellow. And it, it, so he, he tried to persuade Arlene to get excited about fishing, but all she did was get a lot of mosquito bites. And <laughs> That didn't work out, but you know he he was a, a a full person who had this kind of very fun loving side, but was a, a, had another side that was made him very complete as a person. I think. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, the 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 the, the citations don't capture the whole person, right? They don't tell you that John liked horses or oh, that he right. played poker on. The, yeah. the ship over or that he shared his, I think it was his birthday cake. He saved a piece of his a cake that his daughter baked for him or helped bake for him. Yes, that was with his yeah. men. Right. It's, it, it really like the book really captures a lot of him and also, you know, generally the area around Soma Colonia and the people. And it's a very vivid picture that's painted. And it, was, it was fascinating to learn all these details about him and the others around him. Um, that's about our time, Solis. So I'd like to, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, Author Solace Wales, the book is Braided in Fire, and it's a fantastic recreation of a, of a part of World War II that I don't think a lot of people know about. I highly recommend it. Um, to the audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hosting more of these types of events in the future, and we value your support. If you're looking away for get, to get involved, please email media at mohmuseum.org and visit our website, mohmuseum.org, where you can learn more about the project, Medal of Honor recipients, and how you can support us further. Thank you so much, Salas. Have a very good day. Okay, thank you, Corey. Thank you for joining us again. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I can't wait to come to the museum. Yeah, me too. <laughs>